I was told once in a most awkward word, but how the hell do I work for it? I think everybody should have access to art, everybody. It's great to express yourself, it's an honour. It's, it's something that, if, if it is a god or whoever gave me this ability, if I could call it that, I'm pleased. This is my world, and this is what I'm about. This is Reg Gardner. Unfortunately, unless you leave some credits behind you, uh, a mark, nobody will ever know you existed. So that's what I'm after. Just leave that little bit of. Uh, he was, Reg was here. <laughs> Dyed paint in pasto, which is thick. It gives it a three-dimensional effect. It's as if I am actually putting plaster on the picture. So it will have angles, it will have depth. This is where you have something in common with the sculptor. And he, he forms his shape and he's got a, a three-dimensional shape to work at. Well, I'm only going to flat. I'm going to give an impression of a three-dimension. Give you the impression that you can actually turn that corner and walk down the street, you can walk down the road, you can feel a solid as of the brick. And, oh, well, it isn't brick, it's stone. You can feel the warmth of the light. You can. You can feel the air, myself and all artists have got to try and create the feeling of oxygen within that piece. It is a kind of a social history. Even the lamps were done by artists who created in cast iron and they were beautiful um, on, on this side of the street uh, and on that side there are only small lights in the street lights because they're only entourage. Who are they, you know, sort of thing. Sounds a bit political but than, than it is. It's a fact of life. I started as a plein air painter, a young man like most people. But then, as images began to disappear and modernity came in, I did not have a love for that. There is a beauty in ugliness. Brown water can be ugly. To me, it's not. I love water anyway, whatever colour. There's a beautiful curve on this little bridge and the reflection in the water, which is looks as if it's been combed with a comb with a slight breeze. A beautiful sort of um, combination of this soft central little bridge and hard edge mills. And that's what I like in a combination for a picture. It's not a nostalgic thing. This is present day. This is still here now. And even in the past, though I've been accused of nostalgia, I actually painted them um, and so it couldn't be nostalgic because I was in the present day, that was in the present day when I painted them. And I had not thought about anything of the future, not being there. So I just painted and recorded what I saw, what pleased my eye. I'm not attracted to green and rural. It doesn't do a lot for me at all. But um, architecture does, particularly decaying architecture. We don't really notice things. Most people, when they look at the street, Never look up and see there are chimneys. When I ask, particularly in Manchester, how many chimneys are on a certain building in the city centre? And often people will say, no. So I'll stop for, for as much as an hour, an hour and a half, and just look in one spot at everything around me. I'll count the windows, I'll count the archways, I'll, I'll, I'll count the lamps, and I'll, I'll look out. And I'll perhaps take it into a memory. Keep the image through all my senses and um, revisit it from my uh, hidden memory. These places are dead really, they're, 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 not, they're not used anymore, or very little, and they're dead or dying. But they have a beauty in the decay, you know, and the richness, uh, the colours change. When it was new, it was bright red brick. <clears throat> now it's purple and grey and bits of green and a bit of overgrowth, uh, a bit of growth in it. And, um, and this is what I think that kind of attracts me, you know, about it. It's got something absolutely different. There are some lines in this last building that I need to break. One of them is this oblong cream window. 
I need to break it. I'll probably do that with a figure. I can't have anything to lock your eye down at this foreground. It has to be able to release your eye because we need to travel. We are walking into a street now. Just by putting that through, your eye is not now drawn to that spot and not able to get escape. You're able to escape now. It's imperative that you don't get locked in on a certain point. I want to draw them in into the very depths of my picture, you know what I mean? So I do that by um, finding a focal point for a start. You need a focal point. I don't choose a focal point for the viewer, but I need to uh, show the viewer the way I look at a picture. And I watch the viewer, and if I, that I watch their eye, and if it follows the way I've done it, then I've succeeded. Because I've got to make them follow my eye throughout the picture and read it the same way as I do. And then they'll say, oh, I'm interested in that. What's around it? Why is that reacting to that and doing that? Then the next thing is they're asking questions, they're questioning the picture. And then they get, they're going further and further in. And hopefully, they never escape really, in a sense. Even if they come away from it, a day or two later, they want to go and look again, they've missed something out. So there's an intrigue there that they can never discover. I don't really want them to. My canvases are handmade and then fine linen um, my paints are Belgium and uh, Flemish to be honest and um, I hope the best quality I can find money is irrelevant I just want the best when you've kind of worked with the material you, want, you realize that it, it is worth it's worth everything every penny it's a delight to work with and you want the best for yourself, not just for the, the purchaser, but for yourself. You want to know that you're working with the best. It's a thrill to know that the person who's made your canvas and, and, and um, your paints, they're a craftsman as well, they're an artist, you know, and you, you are sharing, you're sharing. Without their ability to mix the pigment and, and have that quality, highest quality, I hope they appreciate uh, uh, the viewers that um, when they compare to uh, uh, perhaps um, somebody's not used that quality they'll see the difference well Monet is um, a capsule in his way uh, the man who put air and light into paintings probably to some degree although I, I'll contest that and say that I think Turner was the first that's for me one of the great painters, a soap shots painter, they called him by the way, the critics at the time. But I love his emotional, flowing, light, sort of uh, smoky scenes, I love it. Just absolutely super. And his Venetian scenes are considered by the Venetian critics as the best, even better than Venetian painters. Is uh, David Cox. I like some American artists. Um, one that impressed me of late is Aaron Gorson. A superb industrial painter of steelworks, to me, is one, is one of their finest impressions. I'm not a great Monet, I mean, I like him, but uh, I'm a more of his arrow, of his scissor, America Sat, um, who, who worked in Paris with uh, the contemporary of uh, Degas, and uh, those sort of painters. So, predominantly, I work kind of post impressionist in a sense late impressionist. I don't consider Monet as a first impressionist, to be honest. Corot and others were prior. I like Braque modernists um, and one or two others, you know. No, it mustn't be found off out. Because a fearsome painter, absolutely wild and beautiful. And when you see them in life, real life, they're not Monet's to in fits with colour and power and energy. But of course the car is considered crazy, cut his ear off, we know that, and put in a mental asylum. But uh, I, I can equate with uh, that kind of person, you know, and, and the emotion that he's gone through. But a great painter, and, and we're all knotters. The reason for using such a small mic is the fact that I use small amounts of tone. I don't mix a massive amount of paint at once, small amounts, so it varies, just like life. 
wear and tear and in different areas you get different wear and others don't um, and so you'll get different tonal values the reason i don't pick up a big knife is i don't want a block area or flat tone or flat color i want it multi-tonal you know as i say slightly different so it's not really noticeable because let's be honest when you walk on a road or a pavement it fouls doesn't it it gets discolored in different parts it's not one one colour is it? And same with a building. By just painting a, a, a bright orange building or something like that, it's it flat as a fluke. It's not. It's not got any oxygen. You know, it just doesn't have any. No grit. It's not had any air to it. It's not had any rain. And it, it just. Um, it doesn't work for me. You think they're great, but just look how I mix them. There's no black. And there's no white. Well then, no. There's a little subtle white to lift it. I rarely, if ever, use black. Because it's, it's the finality of it, um, you can't get any deeper than black, that's the final, it's, um, it's like the depth of space, it's black, it's no light, that's it, it's at the end of. It looks like a theatre but it isn't, it is act in actual fact, um, it's, it's a museum of 20th century uh, clothes designers uh, such as Pierre Cardin, R.D. Amos, etc, etc. These people are queuing up to go in, these people are about to go. So this, there's the narrative within a picture. There's lots of narratives in there. I like to take people into infinity. A, 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 a journey of discovery. I wanted to take them beyond what is in this foreground, way beyond it, and be able to walk in there. And I've said before many times, I want to keep them there as long as I can, involved what is beyond that foreground, what is beyond that midground, into infinity, and um, I love that. It's an odd thing about uh, the way I paint. I can complete that in eight hours, with breaks, about eight hours. But it will take me another eight hours to look over it, over and over again, to look for little things that are very, very important, important, that give that spirit and that soul and that oomph. My wife will come along and she'll say, that's not, doesn't feel quite right. She's the second observer, you see, so, but she's clever. That's not quite right um, if you adjust, and it works. So she's my mentor in a sense. It sounds silly, but she doesn't paint. She's got a great eye. So I need, I need my wife. If she wasn't there, I'd probably make a mess of everything. But she's, she's a controller, and um, in a nice sense. <laughs> so uh, that's where we go from there, and uh, and. Um, and then the rest is just enjoyment.